Good morning. We will call the Local Government Policy Committee to order. Today is uh, Tuesday, March 22nd. It's 8.35. Uh, welcome. Uh, everyone could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, good morning. We do have a, a quorum for the record. Uh, we have two bills up today. Um, the first bill is Senate File 3032, authored by Senator Tomasoni, who I see is online. Uh, Senator Bach will uh, present the bill today. Uh, the bill, this bill will be sent to general orders. Uh, Senator Bach, before you tell us about your bill, I believe you have an A1 technical amendment. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, the A1. The member, this is the first committee, if you could adopt that, to get the bill in the form the author would like it. Thank you. Senator, uh, uh, how can you move the A1, please? So moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 signify by saying aye. 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 Those, those opposed say no. Motion carries. Uh, Senator Bach, to your bill. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, St. Louis County is a very, very large county with uh, a lot of public land, over about 60% of the land in uh, St. Louis County up north is uh, publicly owned. A large piece of that, probably a million acres or so, is county tax forfeited land. And under current statutory provisions, when the county goes to dispose of a parcel of county tax forfeit land, uh, they go out at public auction and they're allowed to advertise it on their auction on their website. And it, that, <clears throat> they started doing that just recently, and it's attracted a lot more attention to tax forfeited parcels and uh, allowed them to kind of, for lack of a better word, kind of push the bidding up and receive uh, a larger, uh, larger money for the parcels. What the law doesn't allow is where the county has what's called fee land, land that the county has purchased. And I think the easiest way to explain that is with an example. If the county decides to uh, widen a road or maybe connect a couple of roads and has to buy some private land, and then they don't use all of it, uh, they would like they would like to be able to dispose of the surplus land that they bought. And uh, currently, the way the law is constructed, they can't do that with an online bidding process. They can only do that with an in-person uh, bidding process. So it, it's actually that simple. They just want to be able to dispose of this fee land that they purchased in the same way that they can with county tax forfeited land. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, county officials here to speak to the bill. And, and Mr. Chairman, it would be nice if they could say something because I asked them to come all this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly. Uh, uh, Mr. Meyer, if you could state your name for the record and who you're with and pre uh, present your testimony. Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator Bach. Um, Chair Senator Jasinski, members of the Local Government Policy Committee, my name is Jason Meyer. I'm the Deputy Director for the St. Louis County Land and Minerals Department. Um, and we're seeking modification of the statute for the primary purpose, uh, as Senator Bach alluded to, to allow online bidding for auctions for the sale of county fee-owned lands um, as an option for, for land sale. Um, our department over the last few years has been given um, more of a directive to manage the county-owned lands, and one of those management directions is sale of certain parcels. Um, and online bidding, um, as mentioned, has proven to be a real effective um, and efficient means of offering property, especially over the last couple of years with, uh, with the pandemic. Um, it, it's um, been, in a, you know, where um, in-person auctions or mailing of auction materials hasn't been uh, possible or recommended. So we've really been successful with the other classes of land we manage and we're just uh, asking for consideration um, to uh, extend that uh, ability to our county owned fee lands. And uh, yeah, thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, Senator Begum. Thank you. Um, first, thank you, Senator Tomasoni, for bringing this wonderful bill forward. Thank you, Senator Bach, for presenting it. Um, I think this is a fantastic idea because, especially in um, counties that have a lot of developable land or a lot of infrastructure projects to connect townships, to connect um, uh, cities uh, in new county roads, there once the plan is finalized, they do see that maybe there is some surplus land or they didn't, as you said, Senator Bach, use all the land. This is a very effective and efficient tool 
for counties to, to use on this. And so um, I support the bill, and I thank you both for bringing it forward. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I just uh, make comment echo. I think echo what uh, Senator Bigham said. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks, Tenor, Senator Thomasoni. We all say hi to you. We miss you. Uh, and thanks, Senator Bach, for uh, presenting the bill. Uh, with that, uh, Senator, how would you like to move the bill? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I move that Senate File 3032 be passed as amended. Oh, it wasn't amended. Uh, as amended. As amended and sent to the floor. Uh, thank you, Senator Howe. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. Motion carries. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bach. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Senate File 3259, authored by Senator Draheim. Uh, before we get to the bill, I've uh, decided since this bill is uh, being heard, has been heard before, uh, we have lots Mr. of testifiers. So we are going to limit testimony to two minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, excuse me for interrupting. I'm here with David Tomasoni. Oh, okay. Go ahead. And he, would like, he would like to say good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. It's a good bill. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. It's a good bill. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. I believe all your bills are good bills. So uh, thank you and congratulations on getting it passed today. As we said, uh, we miss you and uh, it's nice to hear your voice. All right, uh, Senate file 3259. Uh, as I said, this bill has been uh, vetted in other committees. Uh, the testimony was 3 p.m. yesterday. I believe this is the date and we have some written testimony in the folders. Uh, it's my intention to get this uh, discussion finished so we will not have to meet this evening at 7 p.m. Uh, this will be, bill will be laid over. So with that, uh, Senator Draheim, to your bill. Thank you, uh, Chair and members. Um, and I think uh, Senator Tomasoni was referring to my bill. <laughs> well, I'm not chair, but I'm pretty sure. Um, mem members, you know, th this bill, I, I know... Um, has had a lot of discussion. And uh, we're going to hear a lot of testimony. Um, and there, there's going to be, of course, testimony for and against certain parts of the bill. Um, but, you know, I, I think the goal is what we have to remember, and, and that is the pathway to home ownership. And these are free market solutions for that path to home ownership. Um, we have failed in Minnesota on home ownership with a, a certain segment of our population. Um, we have a housing shortage. I truly believe portions of this bill are part of the solution. So with that, I, I think we've we've heard most of this bill before, Chair. So if we just start on the testimony and, and get out of here on time, that'd be great. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. And I'll uh, make comments before uh, everybody remember to state your name and who you're with before you testify. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Peter Coyle. Good morning. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Peter Coyle. I'm a lawyer lobbyist with Larkin Hoffman, Bloomington, Minnesota. I'm testifying this morning on behalf of Housing First Minnesota, which is the state of Minnesota's largest home builder organization uh, with thousands of members serving uh, home buyers across the state. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm testifying on behalf of Senate File 3259, and I want to thank Senator Dreheim for authoring this bill and for the committee agreeing to hear it. Uh, in my law practice, I've, for the last 30 years, I've represented a wide variety of builders and developers and landowners across the state. And it's clear to me from my own professional experience that Minnesota's policy supporting home ownership is failing us. We're producing too few homes and we're producing too few of them at a, point, a price point that enough people can afford. 
to the point where Minnesota has become an outlier across the country. It's undisputed that our regulatory costs in the upper, Minnesota, upper Midwest make the price of building a new home uh, unaffordable for too many people in comparison to our neighboring states. And that's a policy that the state of Minnesota and this legislature ought to try to change. And Senate File 3259 is an important first step in that direction. I'll give you two very specific examples. In my years of practice, I've reviewed hundreds of planned unit developments and development contracts. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen an explosion in the regulatory burdens that cities and the state of Minnesota are imposing on builders and developers as part of the price, literally the price of building a new home. And this bill with the inclusion of uh, section, Article 2, Section 3 is an important step in trying to put the marketplace back in control of the type of house that a builder wants to build and a consumer wants to buy. It doesn't eliminate the use of planned unit developments, but it gives the builder and its customers the opportunity to request the use of a PUD in the appropriate circumstance. In too many cases today, cities mandate the use of PUDs and thus use that as a doorway to mandate costs and regulatory burdens that exceed those that are necessary under the state building code, and they add tens of thousands of dollars to the price of a home. And Mr. Chairman, members, this bill deserves your consideration. It deserves your support. It's an important state policy that you ought to address, and we encourage you to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coyle. Our uh, next testifier is Paul Egger. Go ahead and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Paul Egger. I'm Senior Vice President for Governmental Affairs with the Minnesota Realtors Association. We're a statewide business trade association with over 21,000 members uh, across the state. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senator Draheim's Senate File 3259 and for his efforts to increase housing supply and affordability across the state. I'd like to focus for a minute on some market data that really underscores the importance of this discussion because the inventory of available homes continues to be a serious and chronic challenge for buyers and the overall health of our housing market. The Minnesota Realtors market data report for February shows only 6,606 homes for sale statewide, which is a reduction of over 21% compared to February of 2021. Let me repeat that. There were only 6,000 homes for sale in February. The number of homes for sale in February translates to less than one month supply of inventory, dramatically short of the six months of inventory that represents a market that is balanced between buyers and sellers and where moderate price appreciation occurs. This morning I was looking at our uh, previous market data reports and the last time we actually had six months supply of housing inventory was August of 2014. When buyers compete for scarce inventory, we see the impact on a variety of market metrics. Days on the market was down 6.3% from February of 2021. Pending sales were down almost 10%. Closed sales were down 13%. And then not surprisingly, median sales price was up almost 8% to $304,500. This lack of housing inventory is holding the market back and posing a significant challenge to getting more Minnesotans into home ownership and will continue to do so until some market-driven responses that meet consumer demand are implemented. Senator Draheim's Senate File 3251, 3259 advances an important discussion about how Minnesota can remove barriers to building more housing and create more housing opportunities to meet existing and future demand, particularly at the most affordable price points. I'd like to thank Senator Draheim for his work on this critical issue of housing supply and affordability. We look forward to continuing to work with him and stakeholders on all sides of this issue as Senate File 3259 advances this session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next testifier, Mr. Weiner. Thanks. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Tony Weiner. I'm Vice President with Cardinal Home Builders. We build, remodel, and develop homes on the east, uh, in the eastern side of the metro area here, mainly the Woodbury Cottage Grove, uh, Lake Elmo area. Our company focuses its work on building quality, affordable homes for our customers. One of our areas of emphasis is one-level living, a very popular product among empty nesters and move-down buyers. 
As you've likely heard time and again, it's extremely difficult to build these homes affordably. As a small regional developer and builder, the land costs and regulatory roadblocks are very challenging for us. As a member of the housing industry, I'm ex extremely concerned with the trend away from affordability. Our population is growing, but our ability to house them is becoming more difficult. On a weekly basis, I hear from customers who are interested in learning more about building a new home. However, their budgets are nowhere, near, are nowhere close to what we can build for them, even at the basic entry level home plan. Many of these customers want a $250,000 to $300,000 single family home. The reality of housing today is that we simply can't do that. As a small business, it is far and away the biggest challenge we face. We build safe, energy efficient, durable homes, and we know what our homeowners want. They want to own homes and communities that fit their lifestyles and priorities. There are dozens of fixes that we need to make, but Senator Dreheim's bill here before us today would help lead to a dramatic shift in the right direction for Minnesota's housing market. It will allow for the creation of more starter homes, a product that we dramatically need. Builders aren't looking to put more money into our pockets, we're looking to open up building to a whole new market. This, would, this bill would help return more consumer choice to the market and move us away from the many exclusionary provisions that are added on through a PUD. My family has been in the housing and real estate business for over 50 years. My father, Tom, has testified before many of you in the past, and some of you may remember my aunt, Deanna Weiner. She's a former state senator. They both remember a time when we could build for young families, our workforce, and move down buyers at a price that was affordable. But in 2022, we've gotten so far away from that. We're, we're lucky right now that even with rising interest rates, they still remain somewhat low. But I worry about how, how much worse things could get if they continue to rise. Today, our requirements, our zoning rules, our land costs, lot sizes, our park fees, and engineering requirements, they just don't allow us for the simplicity we used to take for granted that allowed our state to grow and flourish. We should be able to build safe, sustainable neighborhoods that are also affordable, but we have to reimagine a new and better way. I thank Senator Dreheim for the bill and uh, the committee's consideration today. I urge you to uh, please vote in favor of Minnesota having more affordable options. And since I am a small builder, I have to go meet a customer in Cottage Grove in about 20 <laughs> minutes, so I do need to step out. Thank, thank you, you Mr. everyone. Uh, next, we'll shift to go online. Uh, Mr. Fernandez is on my schedule for first. Is he there? Uh, seeing. Oh. Hello, yes, I, I am here. It won't let okay. me. There we go. There you go. Please uh, state your name for the record, uh, with who you're with, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My name is Alex Fernandez. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Government Affairs for the Vinyl Siding Institute. We're testifying in support of SF 3259 today. Um, VSI is the trade organization for vinyl siding and polymeric, polymeric manufacturing in the North America, the United States, and Canada. And basically, we're here in support of it because it remedies a problem in Minnesota by um, by, remit, by reducing uh, the blocks to housing affordability. And uh, Minnesota has the highest housing cost in the Midwest, and the Twin Cities has the widest housing equity gap in the state. Pre-pandemic, Minnesota had the lowest available housing inventory in the nation. Local bans of code-compliant materials are hurting this great state by exacerbating its housing issues. We have evidence um, in the form of five bills similar to this that we've passed in other states that it is, in fact, a remedy to some of the issues facing your state. So for those reasons, I'll, I'll be brief, and we respectfully request that you advance uh, SF3259, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Uh, next on my list is Mr. Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I will be very brief. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you to Senator Dreheim and the realtors and the builders and the other conferees who have testified so far. We've definitely had to go and agree with their points. Um, two things I want to emphasize as it relates to I'm this sorry, bill. can you state your name for the record, please? <laughs> I like the launch in, sorry. Luke Bell with Zillow. Thank you. Uh, the nation's largest real estate marketplace where roughly 230 million consumers a month shop for their next home. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you for reminding me that. Um, wanted to do, drill in on two points real quick. Number one, um, we see the need for this bill as it relates to zoning reform. Um, when we look at the entire Twin Cities MSA region, which is 13 counties, which is roughly where 60% of new housing in the state is built, um, we see, echoing the realtor's point, a massive shortfall in the number of units that are being constructed. Um, over the last 20 years, we are not even building enough units to keep pace with population growth, let alone get at the shortfall of affordable housing that is today. 
Um, we see the need for this bill because it will create new, what we call missing middle units. These are units that are affordable. They're in two to 24 unit structures. They are more affordable than traditional single family homes. Those are the shortfall of units we currently don't see under current zoning rules. All of the housing experts agree that zoning reform is necessary to get at this affordable housing shortage. Um, if you look at polling on the issue, zoning reform is overwhelmingly supported by Minneapolis residents, uh, as, as evidenced in the polling cited in our written testimony. I want to close with stating that we believe this is a predominant cause of what is happening in the, the Twin Cities MSA, the Minneapolis MSA, which is it has the largest black white home ownership gap in the entire nation. While the white home ownership rate is around 76%, the black home ownership rate is around 26%. This is a 50% gap. It is the largest in the nation out of all the municipalities we have surveyed. And we believe a major problem is the overwhelming proportion of land in the region that is zoned exclusively for single family zoning. Uh, we believe this bill would help solve some of those disparities. We commend the sponsor for bringing it forward. Uh, my written testimony has been filed with the committee. We go into more detail on this research in that testimony. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time to testify today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Worshe, are you online? I don't see you. Yep, okay. There I am. Please state your name, who you're with, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is David Worshe. I'm the CEO and owner of Worshe Homes based in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I serve on the board of directors for the Central Minnesota Builders Association and I'm um, a past president as well. I appreciate the time and opportunity to speak with you in support of this bill on behalf of myself and the Builders Association. Um, we appreciate the bill's focus on fundamental reforms that will uh, sustainably reduce the cost of building in a much needed new housing in Minnesota. The bill addresses exclusionary zoning, uh, building and energy codes, aesthetic mandates, and permit reform. In my many years in the industry, I've witnessed attempts at affordable housing in many different, uh, many different angles and perspectives. Bottom line is we need to create affordable housing across all price points, which will put homeowners back in the driver's seat, allowing them the options for housing versus a one-way road mandate that tells them only what they can have. And this, is, uh, this has the potential to bring thousands of new units, housing units online, um, all while not costing the state any money. The answer is not to throw money at affordable housing. It is to change the platform so housing becomes affordable. And that's a big difference. We appreciate Senator Draham has left out um, new fees, which only add to the housing costs, pricing more and more people out of the housing that they need. So again, from a builder's perspective, these kinds of reforms are essential if we're going to build the affordable homes that Minnesota needs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I urge you to vote in favor of the bill and would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Orsha. Uh, next, we'll go back in uh, the uh, room. Uh, first, Mr. Ga Ms. Gao, sorry. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, my name is Irene Gao, and I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities. As many of you know, the League is a membership organization for cities across Minnesota, and it's that statewide nature that I'm going to focus on today. I wanted to start by thanking Senator Dreheim for these really important conversations on housing. Housing is an issue that cities really deeply care about. Since we have a short amount of time, I want to structure my comments specifically on resolutions that have been adopted by cities across the state. In your packets, you have a map. There have been, to date, 99 cities that have adopted a resolution that highlights three things. These cities range from the smallest of our cities across the state, including Watkins, Graceville. Some of our, I'll call them mid-sized cities in Minnesota, would be 1,000 to 15,000. St. Joseph's, Hutchinson, Arlington, as well as some of our metro suburbs, which includes South St. Paul, Hastings, and Minnetonka. 
These resolutions highlight, like I said, three things. One, that zoning is best handled locally, and that's for a variety of reasons. Not only is it that you're taking into consideration what's important to your local community, but it's also things like topography. The geography across our state is varied and that has to be considered. The other thing when it comes to zoning is that public input is taken. It's really important to hear local residents and the concerns and the issues that are happening in those communities. The second thing that these uh, resolutions highlight is that housing is a statewide issue. But the needs are different across the state. They are varied. In greater Minnesota, you'll hear concerns about getting workforce housing or sometimes just getting any developer at all to come build market rate housing. In the metro, recently there's been more of a phenomenon around corporate purchase, investor purchasing that's driving up the cost of rents as well as sales prices or preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing or really just affordable housing for those residents who make the least among us. And the third thing that these resolutions highlight is that we are in need of a state and local partnership. Cities are trying all the time to, do, to have innovative solutions. You're gonna hear later from some testifiers about what those things include, but we can't do it alone. We do have to work together with the state. And so we would encourage, as you considered future legislation that is around housing, that you think about the varied solutions for the varied issues across the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Ms. Gall. Uh, next, Mr. Vander Arde. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Chair, members of the Local Government Committee, Charlie Vander Arde for Metro Cities, which represents the collective interests of cities across the seven county metropolitan region. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Metro Cities opposes Senate File 3259, specifically provisions in the bill <clears throat> that preempt local authority and local decision making in Articles 2 and 4. We'd like to thank Senator Dreheim for recognizing several city concerns on planned unit developments and the negative consequences that would have created for the shared goal of affordable housing in an earlier version of the bill. So Mr. Chair, in the local government committee today, I'll highlight the important but also limited roles that cities play in housing. Cities guide land. They implement zoning and land use policies. They set land uses and densities for different parts of the city in the context of compatible uses and the existing built environment. They package financial incentives, and in some cases, contribute modest public funds to housing development. Additionally, in the metropolitan area, cities are currently required to meet minimum residential densities under regionally set policies that allow cities to guide where higher density and lower density housing can be built. Unique lo local considerations, such as geologies and infrastructure, are considered. The current regional requirement of eight to 12 affordable units per acre is focused on meeting affordable housing needs while also allowing cities to maintain local zoning and land use authorities. Metro cities policies strongly support state funding and sufficient local tools and resources that allow cities to meet those local housing needs. This includes housing infrastructure bonds, down payment assistance, closing cost assistance, home ownership counseling and training, and these existing programs are tied to affordability and serve lower income households, whereas in the bill today in front of you does not guarantee affordability. We'll continue to work with the legislature to support adequate state funding, addressing new home construction, and as well as preserving existing homes. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Van Uh Next, we have Mr. Thanks. Waddell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senators. My name is Jason Waddell, and I'm the City Manager for the City of Prior Lake. Our City Council, Planning Commission, and existing residents are on the front line when it comes to new housing and working to meet the wide spectrum of housing needs for our community, which includes affordable housing. Unfortunately, Senate File 3259 will not serve to address any of the needs in our community, nor offer any assurance of a reduced sales price of a new home. Article 1 encourages cities to enact policy to facilitate the development of affordable housing. Encouraging cities to enact policy is not enforceable, and the city does not believe it's appropriate to place in statute. For cities who already have our comprehensive plans, we are currently designating significant portions of our unbuilt land for higher densities that would accommodate smaller lots and duplexes and fourplexes. Those areas have been thoughtfully planned for and include the appropriately sized infrastructure so to support those needs with larger water mains, larger sanitary sewers, larger storm sewers. This bill would disregard the public process and planning efforts our cities use to establish land use and zoning 
and puts our existing infrastructure at risk. Article 2 would greatly limit, if not limit, eliminate, the tools cities use to work with our developers on mutually beneficial solutions for development and takes away decision-making authority from our local city councils. Prior Lake is unique due to our topography and having a large lake in the middle of our city. This dramatically impacts our utility infrastructure as well as our street network as compared to our sister cities. Every city has their own unique characteristics that impact how they develop. The approach to housing and new development therefore must also be unique to each community. This bill would look to create a cookie cutter approach to land planning that would reduce local control in exchange for a hope of reducing home prices. Article 2 also has an outright ban on all design considerations on any project, whether it be commercial, industrial, apartments, mixed use, which would also be extremely problematic. Can you imagine a city council having zero input on the next apartment building or mixed use project that gets built in their downtown? This bill's title, Legalizing Affordable Housing, is disingenuous and misleading. The proposed bill targets cities and removes local control from the planning and development process. This is purportedly being done in the name of housing affordability. The reality is that local development fees represent only three to 7% of the cost of a new home. In Prior Lake, we have eight homes that are currently in the parade of homes. If you've visited them over the last couple of weeks, of the eight, seven of them were built on small lots and the prices range from 580,000 up to 1.4 million. These, lots delivered, these small lots delivered nothing in terms of affordable housing. Had this bill, Senate File 3259, been in place a year ago, the price point of those homes would be exactly the same today because that's what the market will bear. Nothing in this bill will guarantee or assure any reduction in the price of a new home. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Mayor Worsom. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Brad Wearsom, and I am mayor of the city of Minnetonka. I am testifying today on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities. I am also the current past president of the League, and I am a past president of Metro Cities. And again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Senator Draheim, for hearing city concerns with this bill. Respectfully, we oppose most of the bill. I will focus my comments today on zoning preemp preemption provisions. This bill is titled Legalizing Affordable Housing, but housing policy at the state level should do a number of things. It should address the full spectrum of housing. It should support innovation at the local level. It should focus on providing incentives and tools rather than mandates and it should provide community-specific solutions throughout Minnesota. Unfortunately, this bill does not do that. Instead, it focuses on zoning preemption. Allow me to share a few zoning basics. Zoning regulation is an important planning tool that benefits communities economically and socially. It improves health and wellness and helps environmental preservation. Local zoning regulation allows communities to plan for the use of land transparently. Land use decisions involve residents through public meetings and public testimony. Zoning regulates the kind of uses of property, typically residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural uses. This prevents overlapping incompatible uses like having a home next door to a factory. Cities also allow for multiple types of residential housing not just single family, but also multifamily, mixed use, which includes residential and commercial, and more. Local land use planning and decision making are essential tools in developing community character and identity. Some local recent, some recent land use planning examples in my city of Minnetonka include, we updated an ADU ordinance to allow detached accessory dwelling units in R1 areas of our city. We also extended and expanded the Minnetonka affordable housing policy that requires provision of specific numbers of affordable housing units and new multifamily um, apartment developments. Wrapping up, 
If this bill was really about providing affordable housing, cities would likely be more supportive. Unfortunately, there is nothing to address that addresses affordable housing in this bill. Cities do have a bill, Senate File 3147, that addresses workforce housing issues in greater Minnesota and preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing and truly affordable housing in the metro area. The legislature should be focused on how to partner with cities as they understand their communities best. Thank you again for your time. Have a good day. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, now we'll go back online. Uh, Mr. Metz. Mr. Metz, please state your name, uh, who you're with, and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Greg Metz. I'm a program manager with the Construction Codes and Licensing Division of the Department of Labor and Industry. Thanks for the opportunity to testify this morning on Senate File 3259. I'm here to testify against Article 4, uh, per Building Permit Deadlines. Uh, this section establishes that an agency must approve or deny building permits within 60 days of the application and that failure to deny is approval of the permit. Building officials are tasked with reviewing and approving plans prior to issuing a building permit uh, to ensure that the work is shown, that is shown to comply with the code before the construction begins. I can tell you from my experience, both as an architect and a plan reviewer, that it's a very rare project that is submitted for plan review that completely complies with the codes and is ready for construction is submitted the first time. Most often, final approval takes more than one iteration between architect and reviewer before the plans are shown to comply with the codes. This process does take time and often longer than 60 days for large projects such as schools, hospitals, and nursing homes. Tying an approval or denial to the application date will only result in denials of permit applications due to incomplete work and requiring the applicant to engage in more paperwork to reapply to get the same job done. I also need to mention that approval of plans or the issuing of a permit does not relieve the architect or contractor from needing to comply with the construction codes. Uh, premature permit approval may result in costly required changes and construction delays only discovered after construction, uh, which could have been avoided given a thorough plan review. Furthermore, the language in the bill indicates that a written response is required with the denial. Minnesota rule already requires that code deficiencies identified by the building official need to be communicated to the permit applicant in writing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, Ms. Reynolds. If you could state your name and who you're with and proceed with your testimony, please. Thank you, Chair and Committee. I am Kathy Reynolds, with City Administrator for Fairmont, Minnesota. I'm testifying this morning on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities and the League of Minnesota Cities to provide perspective on how this legislation would impact Greater Minnesota. Today, I'm testifying against SF 3259 because it places unnecessary restrictions on local decision making without addressing housing challenges that we face. We appreciate this committee's interest in tackling the housing crisis. Like the rest of the state, greater Minnesota desperately needs more housing. But this bill is not targeting the challenges that we face. The biggest factor impacting affordability is the high cost of basic housing construction, land, labor, and materials. This makes housing not attainable for most buyers. Fairmont just completed a request for proposals for a developer to build market rate single family or single family attached homes on eight EDA lots um, where the city has put in all of the infrastructure in an attempt to bring developers to the community. We received one incomplete proposal. This is the hurdle that we're facing in greater Minnesota. The cities of greater Minnesota need more housing, and when a developer wants to put in new housing, our cities are working with them to make it happen. If aspects of our ordinances are deterring constructions, we can make that adjustment that is the flexibility that's found in that plan unit development process. We are also concerned about imposing a 60-day requirement on the building permits. The 60-day rule is for when cities control the processes such as zoning approvals. With building permits, contractors are the ones who need to make changes in order for a permit to be approved. How long it takes these to make these changes is outside of the city's control. Fairmont usually completes reviews within a week. 
but we have to wait up. To, we have waited up to six months for a contractor to return documents to us. The 60-day rule would require us to issue denials along with those correction lists and ask contractors to reapply for building permits to avoid permits being issued for construction that does not meet the state building code. This creates an unnecessary level of administrative hurdles for the city and for contractors and does nothing to make sure housing is more affordable. So while the intentions of this bill may be good, none of these cha changes will address the challenges that we face to affordable housing in greater Minnesota. We would like to work with the legislature on addressing the housing crisis that we see, but focusing on the barriers that we're experiencing. We encourage the committee to hear the Comprehensive Housing Spectrum Act, SF3147, as it provides solutions that will help cities across the entire state. In the meantime, we respectfully request that you oppose the bill and instead work with us on solutions that will help us all. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, Senator Graham, thank you for being, bringing this bill for uh, Senator Graham, like speak, go ahead. Can I respond to some of the testimony? Uh, you sure. certainly can, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, great discussion, and, and I agree with the last testifier. That there are a lot of different solutions that are out there, uh, but I, I think most of the solutions involve a lot of money. And I, I don't think all members are aware of how much money we spend for housing. The instability spending, the financing spending, well over a billion dollars a year, not a biennium, a year. Some of the solutions that were brought up would ask for more money. This bill doesn't ask for any money. It's free market solutions. When we do spend money on housing infrastructure bonds is our primary source of creating new units as a state historically. In the Metro, we're spending $600,000 per apartment unit, not per building, per apartment unit. Is that really affordable? I, I, I think we have to look at it. We can either spend more money on HIBs, and if we do the governor's plan, we'll be spending more on debt service for housing infrastructure bonds or HIBs than their current budget for our housing agency here in Minnesota. We can't continue at that pace. We need all hands on deck. I think everybody that testified for and against this bill want the same thing. We want to improve the housing market in Minnesota. We all have kids or grandkids that are looking to buy a house. Housing costs too much. Rent costs too much. We've had that discussion here in your committee for rent control. I thank you for that hearing. Uh, I just want to point out one handout that's in your packet, members, that shows the average cost of a new house in the Midwest. Look where Minnesota is. We're at the highest. Um, I, I do think some of the things brought up um, against this bill must be the bill on the other body and, and not the bill that we're discussing today. If, if you look at the first page, member, on lines 1.2, as part of this comprehensive municipal plan, they're encouraged to do the things that were discussed. But it doesn't say they have to do it. We're just trying to push the envelope, trying to get cities to do the right thing. There are a lot of cities, especially in rural Minnesota, that are begging people to move to their town. But we're not trying to be heavily handed on that. We're trying to encourage them to have a section of town that has a little denser population. That's it. Um, we've had decades of the same policy, decades and decades, and billions and billions of dollars spent. And where has that gotten us? We have the highest cost of housing in the Midwest, outside the coast, really. We have the lowest inventory of houses, and we have the highest equity gap in the metro than the whole nation. And as a state, overall, we're fifth lowest. 
the National Association of Builders puts out a survey, and it, it shows for every thousand dollars you add to the cost of a home, you eliminate so many people in a particular state. So in, in Minnesota, over the decades I've been involved in housing, it, it usually ranges between three and 4,000. So for every thousand dollars we add to the cost of a home, we're eliminating three or 4,000 of our neighbors or our neighbor's kids or grandkids to be able to afford to buy that house. So just let that sink in a little bit. Now, when, when we go to the codes, the energy codes, which my bill here asks just for a time out, we have the strictest building codes in the country here in Minnesota. And, and if you're a neighboring uh, senator on a border with another state, I'm sure you've heard from people that lose out to across the border. And, and I know we don't have a ton of time here, um, but the last time we adopted the building and energy codes, it added eight to $12,000 to your typical home. Okay, take that times your three or $4,000 number. And that's just one piece of the pie. And then you put in all the fees that go along with building a new house, that eliminates a lot of people. So I have a quote in this article here. It's, it's a Min Post article um, on, on building code. And the builder's talking about a home that he built and the code changes added 7307 to the cost, $7,307 to the, to the house. And that would save $167 a year in energy savings. Okay, it would take him 43 years for that homeowner to break even, 43 years. So we all want energy efficient homes. We all want the safest home we can, but at what cost? So do people stay in 100 year old old houses like I lived in for quite a few years? Um, or do we want a nice, clean, safe, newer home that isn't perfect? We are chasing perfection, but at what cost? Um, so here's an, another example. Um, this is a report on the energy code. Um, it says uh, Department of Energy report suggests upgrading from the 2012 to 2015 codes in Minnesota. Um, would save just $118 over 30 years, $118. So I'm saying, let's take a time out on the energy code. If there's something really breakthrough, they can come back to us, us 201 elected officials here at the state, and we can decide if it's that important to update it and, and do it without uh, any problem. Um, state funding. Um, you, you guys know I've been the biggest champion for housing, from housing infrastructure bonds and trying to get creative on, on you name it, on, on housing. We can't buy our way out of this. We have 50,000 housing units we need. 50,000. Take that times your 600,000 per unit. And you guys all know what new houses cost in your neighborhood, and, and it does vary a little bit. Um, we can't buy our way. The state can't afford to go in and, and build all these homes. We need free market solutions to get everybody on board to help us. Um, the, the tools that the cities have are, are important. PUDs are important. We are not eliminating PUDs. We are not eliminating PUDs, plan unit development, or PUD, sorry, I should say that. Um, we are saying that if you already have zoning right now, and a house can be built there, you, you can't, or a tract of land that's zoned for residential, you have to let them build without putting strings on it. If it's already in your, in your state or your city uh, charter, the one thing we're trying to eliminate 
is something you can't do unless you use a PUD, and that's why we've seen the use of PUDs go up, and that is the aesthetic mandates or the appearance of a house. We all want the perfect neighborhood, no doubt. This bill, you can still have the house the way you want it. Um, if you want brick on the front, you can still do that. If the developer wants to build spec homes with brick on the front of it, they can still do that. But we're saying the city shouldn't mandate that as they come in. Um, you know, we, we talked about the fees in the past and in this bill, we're asking for just better record keeping on them. I think that's something we've tried to work with, with the, the cities on. Um, you know, it's a lot of talk, a lot of talk of, about um, local control. And, you know, our country was formed in such a way that the government is there to protect the individual rights. And our country was based on, and we have a, a teacher in the room that probably could elaborate on that, but it was founded on property rights. My grandpa left Germany to come here um, as a little boy because they got chased off their family farm by the government. And when our country was formed, that was one of our fundamental rights, was property rights and the right to own property. Um, when we talk local control, to me, local control is the individual, the property owner. Yes, we should have strings attached. I, I think we all agree on that. We have to have some safety concerns um, with the property. But I think we also have to remember that we're, we're, not, we're not here to give free reign to a smaller unit of government just because of local control. Sometimes we have to step in. We're the ones that give most of the cities their charter. Um, and, I, and I think this is a common sense approach to free market solutions that doesn't cost our general fund any money. So I urge your support. I could ramble on for hours, Chair, I apologize. Um, I know we're out of time. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Uh, I was gonna give you till 9.30, so, but uh, thanks for uh, finishing up. I was about to stop, but uh, thanks for your enthusiasm and your passion. We all know, we've all seen it uh, through the committees in the last couple of years for housing and what you're trying to do and, and the overall goal we totally get. I totally understand. Uh, thanks to all the testifiers uh, who abided by the time limits and a great testimony uh, on, uh, before, on behalf and against the bill. There's no doubt there that we're hearing uh, Valid points on both sides. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it to member questions. Uh, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually don't think this has anything to do with property rights at all because you're, you're buying a property that's already developed. You're, you're building a home or you're um, buying an existing home. So I don't think this has anything to do with property rights. Um, I do have to say it has everything to do with um, the big heavy hand of government coming down and uh, big overreach. And that's what this bill and the bill last week does when you deal with preemptions. I have to say, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, you did a fantastic job, but the two administrators, city manager and administrator from the city of Prior Lake and city of Fairmont just did outstanding in explaining why this bill uh, should not move forward, should not be included um, in an omnibus bill. Uh, I'm gonna also take it one step further and uh, I know that either the mayor or the two managers slash administrator can correct me if I'm wrong. PUDs are requested by developers because they, they, they buy a land and then they want to have a specific type of house in that, mm -hmm. that land and they want certain aesthetics or whatever and they need help. And so, or adjustment to code or whatever. And so I would say it would be extremely rare um, 
that a city would be like advertising a PUD. Um, so I don't understand that part of it. The preemption alone, um, each community is unique. I would argue that each of my cities have a unique character to them and they deserve that right to develop that as local elected officials and managers and uh, folks to be able to do, um, to do such. I also worry about historical side of things. I have very his cities that are very old. Um, so whether it's Hastings, Newport, South St. Paul, uh, and, and this hinders their ability to kind of deal with historical integrity and, and issues within that characteristic of the, of the city. I also would argue that the section you brought up mentioned, um, Senator Dreheim, about the energy code. Geothermal has a buyback of five to 10 years. You would, if this would go into law, you would prohibit any changes to that code, whether it would be tightening it up or loosening it up, because you're saying that it has to be within five to 10 years, and geothermal, the average is about five to 10 years on a payback on that. And a lot of, the, um, a lot of developers um, and, and homes are actually including those now in them uh, as an option. And, and so um, I don't see anything in this bill that would make housing more affordable. And the, one of the last things I'm gonna say is um, the, the developers often, this was already said, the builders, I mean, often need time extensions to fix things when you're looking at, at the permitting process. So the, the 60 day issue is very problematic from a worker safety perspective but from a quality of the home you're spending your hard-earned dollars uh, building or renovating. So I will say this. I, I know Senator Dreheim, and we've had many conversations about this. You have done a lot for, for housing and trying to fix this problem. There's no doubt it's a problem. No one in this room would disagree that affordability in housing to achieve that dream of home ownership is a problem. It is. Um, I think... The struggle is um, it does cost money to match those funds. And I know that you want to do something more than that. I know that. I think everybody in this room does. This is not it. Taking authority away from a city to uh, do what they know how to do best, not up here, um, that it's important to, to remember that we are to be a partner with our local governments, not an adversary. And um, I think this proposal is problematic in many ways, but I just want to thank the um, testifiers on both sides because I think we just keep hearing the same um, concerns. And so clearly this isn't the answer. I don't think the bill last week overturning an election um, is an answer. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe one of these days we'll have a conversation where there are some answers in it. Um, until then, thank you uh, for the testifiers and um, the great discussion. Thank you, Senator Bingham. I'm, we're going to go to, to the uh, Senator's first members, and we'll go back to you. But so, okay. Senator Swidinski, you're next. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't really have any questions. I just want to. This is the second week in a row I'm proud to be a member of the Senate, and it's a lot of, because of you, Senator Dreheim, I feel like the last two weeks we've talked about the American dream and that how can we get people to, to reach that thing, and you talked about your grandparents coming here for that very reason, and there's a lot of people right now that aren't realizing the American dream that, are, that some of our own ancestors got to, and so what is in the way. One of the things that really bummed me out in some of the, it was a uh, statistic from the Zillow um, letter and uh, the home ownership rate is currently 26% for black Minnesotans and for white Minnesotans it's 76%. That's three times. That's almost criminal. That And so what 
Will this bill help that? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm ag like I did last week. I'm agonizing over this issue because both sides. And I just want to compliment you, um, Chair, because this is how I, I, I've always perceived committees would be run. You know, that we'd hear from both sides of every issue, and then we, uh, senators, take those comments from both sides, and then we decide which side we think is best for our constituents and our communities and the, and the people of Minnesota. So um, I'm done thanking people, though, today. So um, I'm going to get crabby again. So um, the, the, and you know, and I'm guilty of this as well of of trying to have mandates upon the schools because you know I, I I am a product of that career path and so I kind of know what maybe schools need or at least I think I do and um and whenever I issue or I, I tr pr pr um, introduce a bill issuing um, proposing a mandate on the schools, um, the things I hear from many of my colleagues is. Um, you're stifling, and this is, um, I'm paraphrasing from the city's letter, um, you're stifling innovation, you, you're, um, um, you're, provide, you're not providing incentives, you're providing mandates instead of incentives for creative thinking, and lastly, um, providing community-specific solutions through Minnesota. And when we mandate on our schools, and again, guilty as charged, uh, I wonder if, if maybe leaving the schools and the communities alone to do the best thing, and then as any democracy is supposed to work, um, the laboratories of democracy are our cities, our counties, our school districts, and then their great ideas percolate to the top. Um, and so I, I just want, okay, I will thank you one more time. I, I wanna thank everybody in this room for making me think about all this stuff. I guess, though right now, it, um, I would, pop, well, I know I am, I'm voting against this bill, and you know, one of the t testifiers said three to seven percent of the new homes are for undue regulations and burdens. And I, I, I don't, I, I'd love to see a list sometime of the 10 most, um, the 10 burdens we'd like to get rid of. The, the, what, what is that list would look like? Because I know when we sold our house, one of the things we had to do was a radon test. And it was a hassle and I didn't want to pay for it. I think it was like 1500 bucks. And, uh, and we found out our house was <laughs> full of radon, and no way should I be able to um, sell that house without taking care of, of, of mitigating that radon factor. So I'm just wondering if somehow, and maybe Senator Jaheim, you and I could someday um, come up with a list of those 10 regulations that we really truly think are undue burden upon the homeowners. And so uh, anyways, thanks for um, indulging my, um, some of my thoughts I had today. And, uh, Again, from the bottom of my heart, um, the last two weeks have been how a bill becomes a law 101 at the committee process. So thank you for that, both of you. Thank you, Senator Swodinski. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I do agree with the, the city perspective that they want to be partners, not preempted. Uh, Mayor of Maplewood uh, reiterated that to me last night in a message. Uh, and Senator Draham, I think in your preliminary closing remarks, you said you weren't sure whether they, the cities understood your most recent version. I'm assuming they did, or they would have modified their testimony. Whatever, it's going to be laid over as I understand it. And my fundamental question right now is, what is the path for bipartisan resolution? Um, the cities have obviously agreed on the crisis, and I know you're working very hard to address it. The, one of the remedies that's been advocated is uh, Senate File 3147 uh, that Senator Dietzik has. Uh, I don't know if that's going to come before this committee or how much you have vetted this, but there needs to be a bipartisan path to address this. So. Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, could you outline what is the bipartisan path? Otherwise, we're at gridlock. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator. We are just before we go to Senator Dreheim, uh, we have not had a request for Senate File 3147 for the committee, just so I want to clarify that. Uh, it's not been requested yet. I think it's still stuck in housing in the other body. But I'm going to go to Senator Dreheim. Senator Dreheim. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I would like to kind of just hit just real briefly um, on these things. And if I could give uh, Mr. Coyle a chance just to respond to the, the PUD question for Senator Bigham. And 
kind of the the use of the PUDs? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Bigham, I've reviewed hundreds of development agreements, as I indicated previously. I'm personally aware of cities that mandate the use of PUDs. It's not the choice of the builder. Often it is. But in the cities that I'm familiar with, which I'm not going to attempt to name here this, today, we don't have the time for that, I'm personally familiar with city policies that mandate the use of PUDs as a condition of proceeding with single-family housing. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I'm sure there are in cases of historic preservation or unique environmental issues or um, a, a, a change when but zoning that, codes can't be. If, if I could on Senator that, Graham. that it wouldn't stop or prohibit PODs to be used uh, for geology issues. Um, you know, the, the, we're just talking about the appearance is what we're trying to do. And if it's already zoned for it, like it used to be, you know, when I was growing up, you had tracks that were clearly marked for residential, commercial, mixed use, et cetera. And that's kind of gone away. If you look at all your open land in your communities right now, um, especially closer you get to the metro, you, you'll see that they're they're not clearly defined as what type of use they are. Um, and they're more PUD type. So I, I, if I could, the energy code was brought up and the geothermal, thank you, Peter. Um, <laughs> this wouldn't stop that. You still have the right, going back to property rights, you still have the right as a property owner to decide to put geothermal. I think geothermal is wonderful. I tried to get a bill last year done on geothermal. I uh, got a lot of pushback on that, um, trying to create a new, new technology for that, if you remember that bill or not. Um, so I'm a big fan of geothermal. Uh, th this wouldn't prohibit geothermal. You could still do that. We're, we're trying to set a floor, and it's mainly based off of cost. So if we want your grandkids and your neighbor's kids and grandkids to be able to afford a house, at some point, we, we have to say enough's enough. Let's take a time out. Let's get things caught up. And we started on this way before the labor shortage we have right now and the lumber prices going way up. So I, I get that. But I think what you have to ask yourself, um, Senator Bigham, is what we've been doing for the last 40 years, has it really worked? And then you go to um, the comment that's been made about the equity gap before. Who's it working for? Are we just growing the gap between the haves and the have-nots? And, and that's what I'm trying to slow that gap down because it is spreading so fast. Uh, those of us that are fortunate, and I am one of those fortunate people that own a nice home in a nice neighborhood, are my kids going to have that same opportunity? And that's what I'm fighting for. And I think most of us here are fighting for our kids in the future of Minnesota because we care about our kids. So... Um, you know, some other, other comments um, that, that were made uh, about us intervening with the cities uh, and getting creative, inventive. I, I, I think this bill only helps that. It doesn't hurt that. So I would argue the exact opposite, but so the testimony was that if we want to get inventive and get creative, we have to get out of the way and let the builders and the property owners within some guide rails get creative. So I would argue that. Um, on the, the equity gap, part of the reason we have such a big equity gap is called redlining. And, and redlining was actually created by government and our big banks. And it drew actually a red line around parts of the city that said more or less whites only in here. And you couldn't sell to people that didn't look like me. Um, I am trying to avoid that with, I think, some of the things that are being done. And I have been told by some of the cities, they want to keep, quote unquote, the riffraff out of their communities. And that isn't right. Everybody should have the opportunity for the American dream and that pathway to homeownership. So that's what we're fighting for. Um, 
couple more comments. Sentinel file 3147, I, I think has a big fiscal note attached to it. So I think that's the reason it probably isn't moving in a non-budget year. Um, but in our committee, we are very, in the housing committee, we are very, very, very bipartisan. We have great discussions like we've had today on some really tough issues. Talk to Senator Rest, talk to Senator Deed Six, Senator Port. They will tell you that it's all hands on deck. We try to review all ideas um, and, and push the boundaries because we have to do things different, members. What we've been doing isn't working. So I appreciate your time. Chair, I really appreciate you taking on this difficult subject and uh, having a hearing on it. Uh, thank you, Senator Graham. I, I was like the comments, preliminary closing comments before. Someone made that comment. Uh, but now we've had preliminary and final closing comments, but I want to thank Senator Graham. We all know your passion. Uh, and I, just a little bit of background on me. I've been involved in, in real estate and local government for 29 years. So everything in real estate I think I've done from an appraiser to property management to sales to developed and all those. And on the city side, I've done anything from a planning commission member to a city council member to a mayor. So everything that's been discussed here today, I see valid points on both sides. So it is very difficult. And, and I, I love what you're trying to do because it, it's exactly, we all agree that we need to get housing more affordable. Uh, I'm just uncomfortable to the compromise we're at today. So, and I think there's a lot of, we still haven't got there yet, but it's not because you haven't worked hard on it because we know we've done that. Uh, but at this point, um, Anybody else? And otherwise, uh, we're going to lay this bill over. Uh, seeing none, uh, this will, bill will be laid over again. Th thank you to all members, to all testifiers, and thank you, Senator Drayheim. So, thank you. Uh, with there being no other items on the agenda, we are hereby adjourned. Thank you.